this morning. The next subject under God word. Responsibility it is the fear of the Lord. It's our ethical duty to fear God. And just the reverse of that is true. It's our ethical duty not to be afraid of anyone or anything. Hallelujah. Psalm 27 to begin with. Oh, yeah. Psalm chapter 27. We are to fear no one Hallelujah. and nothing. Amen. Psalm 27, 1. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Whom? He's speaking of people here. The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. What a verse there. We don't Amen. have to be. And we're commanded no! not to be afraid of anyone except the Lord. That's right. He's our light and our strength, our salvation. We're to fear him and we're to fear no one else. Then in the third verse, we're to fear nothing. No one, nothing. Though a host should encamp against me, my heart will not fear them. Though war should rise up against me, in this I will be confident. I will not be afraid of war then. <coughs> Turmoil, strife, economic hardship or problems, the plunging of the stock market, the unemployment rate rising. I will be afraid of nothing and of no one. Now we have a lot of text at which I want to take the time to look this morning. So Psalm 56 in verse 4, uh, to again reiterate that we are to fear no one to begin with, and then secondly, nothing. Psalm 56 in verse 4. The wisdom literature of the Bible is filled with teaching on the fear of the Lord. Book of Psalms, book of Proverbs. But it's going to be surprising to see where it's found besides those places because it is found in other places. In God, in God will I praise his word. In God I put my trust and I will not fear what flesh can do unto me. Hallelujah. I mean, the early Christian martyrs certainly had to have verses like this down. This concept of the fear of the Lord. I'll not fear what any flesh can do to me because... Uh, Psalm 27, 1, they really can't do anything to you. Hallelujah. They can take the body, but not the soul. But if you don't fear the Lord, of course, you'll compromise whenever times like that come. So this isn't, again, a little pet doctrine. I think you'll see how crucial this is and how you can tell whether or not it's working in your own life that you fear God. Psalm 118 and verse 6. The Lord is on my side. That's right. I will not fear, because what can man do unto me? Hallelujah. See, they can kill you. They can fire you from your job. They can cut off your income. They can persecute you. They can burn your home down. They can wreck your car. But that's just items there. What can they do to you? They can't do anything to you as long as you fear the Lord and you don't fear them. He said, the Lord is on my side. That's why I'm not afraid of anyone. Proverbs 29 and verse 25. Amen. You've got to think about this. You're not to be afraid of anyone. Amen. And then don't bog down and say, well, aren't children to fear their parents? Well, they fear the Lord's authority in their parents. Amen. So it's still, you trace your fear back to the Lord. I mean, if Moses were around today, you probably wouldn't call him up on the phone and say, hey, buddy, how about a game of cards tonight? You just probably wouldn't do that. Why? Because you'd be afraid of Moses. But it's really not the man Moses. He was just flesh and blood. Yeah. You'd be afraid of the God that lived in Moses is what you'd be afraid of if Moses were around. So I guess we stay with what we started. You're to fear no one. No one. You don't fear Moses or Paul if they were around because they're Moses or Paul, but because who they represent. And therefore, yeah. it's a fear of the Lord, not a fear of them at all. <sighs> or then you're going to be brought into bondage to some man. <coughs> It's what shepherdship is all about, to get the people to fear their leaders, be afraid of their leaders, their shepherds, because your shepherds, they tell us, are the doorway into the kingdom. They hold <laughs> truth and the life in their hands, and if you do something they don't like, well, they'll just turn it off from you. 
But it doesn't work like that because then you'd have to be fearing man instead of fearing the Lord. And the fear of man brings a snare, Proverbs 29, 25. But whoso putteth his trust in the Lord shall be saved. Amen. What do you think this snare is? Well, the snare is compromise. The fear of man bringeth a snare. A snare in Scripture is, is spoken of as calamity or of sin into which one falls. You fear man rather than the Lord, and you'll compromise something to gain a pleasing look from his eyes instead of from the Lord's. That's the snare that you're going to fall into if and when a person fears man. Now, I've fallen into that snare before, and you only fall into that whenever you don't fear the Lord. When you fear the Lord, you're not going to fall into the snare of being afraid of what man or men or women or people or anybody thinks about you or has to say about you. Hebrews 13 and verse 6. So we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. Just like Psalm 118 and verse 6. The Lord is on my side. I will not fear, because what can flesh do unto me? I'll not be afraid. And then back to the book of Psalms for a lack of fear of anything else, and that would be Psalm 23 and verse 4. He's not talking about people here, but about things. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. And again, it's because thou art with me. So I think it's rather clear we're to fear nothing and we're to fear no one. But the Lord God, all of our reverence and our fear and our respect and our honor and our awe has to be directed towards the Lord God Almighty. If you fear the Lord, of course, you're going to walk obediently in his will then. You're going to do what he tells you to do because... You fear the consequences of living a life that's displeasing to him. Amen. You're just not going to be afraid of what people have to say about you. Anyone who contradicts the Lord, you're going to contradict them. That's right. That's right. Because you yeah, fear yeah. the Lord and you don't fear them, what their yeah. opinions are. I was speaking with a brother on the phone yesterday uh, that I guess bears repeating because it fits in because we got on the same subject here. And... He said, you know, I li he listens to our tapes on, on occasion. He's listening to some now. And he said, whenever I listen to your tapes, he said, sometimes I just have to turn them off and sit back in my chair. And he said, I just start laughing. So I knew him well enough to know he wasn't going to criticize me. He wasn't laughing for the wrong reason. I was trying to find out, though, what were you laughing about? He said, you have such a sharp tongue. He said, you hate the denominations Hallelujah. Like, uh, he said, I've heard other it's people, a lot of God. people preach against the denomination. But he said, there's something pure about your hatred about them. Amen. And I'll say, and I told him, I said, I'll tell you why. I said, we don't pick the denominations just as a good sermon topic to always be raking them over the fire. Yeah, we just hate them. I said, we love the Lord's way and anything that offers a compromise somewhere else because God's against that, we're against that. Yeah. Yeah said the people they could be baptist catholics we don't care about that they can have no name we don't care about that i said what i care about is the fact that they have annul the word of god by their religious traditions and i said that's why we have such a pure holy hatred for them and any other way besides the lord's way we fear the lord and i told him i said if people contradict god i'm going to contradict them that's right he said i don't even let my wife listen to your tapes and I gave him a little lecture about some things in his life because he said, I, I think that, he said, because I know you, I don't think it's from personal spite or bitterness. He said, but I don't know if anybody else can handle those. And I said, do you know what, brother? I said, that's why we don't have a tape program where we mail our tapes all over the place. Because I said, the people in our church know me. So you don't have to redefine everything. Can you imagine if someone picked up one of our tapes and heard some of them come? It makes them just as mad as a wet hen when they hear some of those things. Why? Because they don't know me. They don't know what's going on here. He said, I know you, but anyone else, they're going to think you are, the, you are filled with more bitterness and spite and revenge than anyone I've ever heard before. <laughs> and so I told him, I said, I trust you can see that's not the case. And he said, I see that because I know you well enough. 
But he said, no one else. He said, I don't let anybody hear your tapes. He's, he's got lots of tapes. But he said, I do not. You're the only ones that I don't loan out. And I said, I appreciate that. Because if you started doing that and it caused problems, then I'd stop sending you my tapes so you wouldn't get them. So you couldn't loan them out then. He said, yeah, you're different in that area too. I said, we're not a mail order house. Most ministers will do anything to get you to buy their tapes. I said, we send our tapes to whom we want to send our tapes. And I said, if we don't want to send them to you, we just won't send them to you. I said, I don't owe you anything. Amen. He said, don't get me wrong. He said, he said, I'm glad. I'm grateful for the tapes. <laughs> he thought I was going to cut him off. And after some things he said, he said, well, maybe I'm not going to be getting anymore. And I said, maybe not. I said, because, you know, hearing my tapes and not obeying them is not going to do you any good. That's right. So I'm wasting my time sending them to you, and you're wasting your money to buy them, though. People don't understand. They don't understand where we're coming from Amen. because there are a lot of other critics out there in the world who are criticizing because they don't have anything better to talk about right. than to talk about the negative all the time. And that's not, our, that's not the impetus. That's not the basis. That's not the reason here at all. It's because we fear the Lord. We don't want him or his word to be misrepresented today. I feel that we're his ambassadors. We're his voice here on the earth. Amen. That's right. And if he's misrepresented in some way, we're going to have to do our best to correct that. Yeah, he do doesn't that. shout down from heaven to say, now, you people have it wrong over here. You people have it wrong over there. But I'll sure say that. You people have it wrong over there <laughs> because he wants to speak through us. Amen. Right. Amen. He said, sometimes in the back of your mind, don't maybe just something comes in the back of your mind. Maybe we ought to walk this path a little more lightly because I mean after all you can find verses of criticism but then you find other verses in the Bible that seem to speak of love covering a multitude of sins and Jesus being merciful and Jesus being kind and I said I'll tell you a little story about that brother and I think I've told it around here before but it's worth repeating to make sure you have it in your heart I said I used to think that way oh I would preach against things but in the back of your mind Every now and then a little thought would come to you, now how can all of these people, every one of them, be so wrong? After all, we've got this verse, that verse, and the other verse to consider. And I said, whenever I thought that, that's what got me into trouble in my life in the past. And I said, people, religious leaders, have lied to me. Amen. That's and cloaked it over with their authority, or this is from this verse, or whatever. And because I didn't fear the Lord enough, I didn't challenge them to get that corrected. And I said, that's caused problems in my life before. And I said, we're not going to have any more of those problems. I said, I do not listen to anything anymore besides what I myself am totally convinced is in the Word of God. And I said, in the last few years, it saved me a whole lot of heartache and a whole lot of trouble. Because I, one thing, I can put up with a lot, but I hate it when someone lies to me, trying to make a fool out of me over spiritual matters. That's right. I hate being treated like an animal, a beast who can't think for myself. And I said, I won't have that anymore. I am only open. You know, people say, well, you ought to at least be open. Well, God never says you're to be open for deception. Amen. Be open to hear the truth, and once you get the truth, then you close the door. That's right. I said, the door in my life has been closed on the denominational system. It's been closed on the charismatic movement. I will not even listen. I will not even think about the thought, well, could you not maybe be wrong? And after all, God's baptizing so many people in the Spirit out there, and they're trying their best to follow God, and, and you're the only one who has the truth, you're always saying, and if you're not their teacher, how can you expect them to learn? And all these weak arguments. Mm -hmm. And I said, but that has cost me in my life in the past because I didn't fear the Lord. Because when you fear the Lord, you're not afraid of anyone's opinion. You're not afraid of anyone's teaching. You're going to just axe it to pieces if it can't be based on the word of God. And I said, you've got to put a period there, which I think he's still struggling on a little in his life because there's such a multitude of deceivers out there that you get deceived here and deceived there, and then pretty soon you just don't want to trust anybody. And I said, that's about where I am. I just don't trust anybody. I trust myself. I said, because I think I know me better than I know anybody else in the world. So I trust what I believe, I trust what I have to say, but no, I don't trust what others have to say because I've been lied to so many times. I've been deceived by well-meaning people. But when you fear the Lord, you won't be deceived, though. You see, that's the snare you fall into whenever you fear man. Whenever you fear the Lord, you won't be deceived. 
He won't, he won't allow you to be deceived. Praise because God. when you fear him, he's going to open up this word, this truth to you. And whenever you stop fearing him, that means you're going to believe some man's report, even when it can't be based in scripture, you're going to believe some man's report above God, then you're opening yourself up to delusion there. But God doesn't tell us to, to remain open our whole life for everything, only open for the truth. Amen. And once you've got it, then you close the door after that. If you don't, then here comes error in after that. And then you mix truth and error. Oh, that's happened to you before. You'd have the truth and leave the door open and you'd let some air and some negative thoughts and some unscriptural thoughts about that thing in there. And then you have a hard time determining what really is the will of the Lord in that area. And I said, I won't do that anymore. I said, I'll, I'll plead innocent every time to anyone who says I'm, I'm uh, critical from a bitter standpoint. I said, I'll plead innocent every time. But I said, I'll, be, I'll plead guilty to being just as biting and as, as sharp as can be whenever people are misrepresenting and perverting the living word of God. Amen. Who else is going to do it around yeah. here? That's right. But a group like ours. So I'm going to be just as biting and as sharp as I possibly can be. Because it's a lot of that sharpness that wakes people up. That's right. Amen. I mean, if anything will, it won't be a blunt word, it'll be a sharp word That's right. Amen. that wakes people up. So no, God is not working in the system. I refuse to believe that. Amen. He's not working in the Baptist church. He's not working among Catholics. He is not working in the church of our day. He's not working in the system. Well, and I don't even sit there and think, well, aren't a few people getting saved? Whether a few people get saved or not, it's not the issue. Is God working in the system? No. The system has been abandoned ever since the beginning because it's not of God. So no, I don't sit and wonder and worry about those things anymore. When you get a proper fear of the Lord and you don't fear people, you don't fear what they think about you, um, then you'll gain more of the word of God and you'll lose more of your deceptions, that's for sure. Well, the scriptures say we're to fear him both as a sovereign Lord and King and as a heavenly Father. He's to be awed and respected in fear. Now, I say both of those because generally... The fear of the Lord is watered down and spoken of as godly reverence, which just in the terminology doesn't hit me like fearing God does, being godly reverent toward the Lord. But there's a deeper and much more serious aspect of, of fear. The fear of God is not at all absent from the Hebrew and the Greek terms that are used. According to Malachi 1, Malachi 1 in verse 3, this fear, because we're slaves of God, is our ethical duty. Where Malachi said that a son honors his father and a slave his master. And God says, if I then be a father, where is my honor? And if I be a master, where is my fear? Malachi 1, 6. If I am a father, where is my honor? If I am a master, then where is my fear? Now I want to break it down into looking at the fear of the Lord as a sovereign king and the fear of the Lord as our loving, tender, heavenly father. These are two ideas in Scripture, and they're both true. And they're both included uh, in the term fear, and the fear of the Lord. Uh, sometimes both will be included, sometimes only one, depending on the context, as we'll be able to see in looking at a few of these passages. But if you've ever heard anything about fear, they always say, well, that means to have godly reverence towards the Lord. Especially when you get over to the New Testament, you don't want to have anything like being afraid of God as a sovereign king. Well, let's begin in the old and we'll look at the new later. Job 37, verses 23 and 24, speaks of the fear of the Lord as sovereign Lord and king. Job 37, 23 and 24, the last two verses. Now here I think it's, it, it's easy to determine that he's not speaking of fear of God as Father because of the way in which he is addressed.
touching or concerning the Almighty, not our kind, gracious Father, but concerning the sovereign God, touching the Almighty. We cannot find him out. He is excellent in power. You see, this speaks of his sovereignty and his majesty. He is excellent in power, in judgment, plenty of justice he will not afflict. He will not afflict. In plenty of justice he will not afflict. Men do therefore fear him, and he does not respect any that are wise of heart. He respects those who have wisdom in heart based on the fear of the Lord, but not intellectual wisdom. Men do therefore fear him. Jeremiah 10 and verse 7. Who would not fear thee, O king of nations? For to thee doth it appertain, for as much as among all the wise men of the nations and in all their kingdoms, there is none like unto thee. Praise God. He said, unto thee it appertains that we fear. Who would not fear thee, O king of nations? Jonah 1 and verse 9. Here with the other terminology that's used, you can see that it's speaking of fear of God as sovereign Lord and King. And remember the personal illustrations we've begun with this morning, that when you fear the Lord, then you're going to do your best from a good and honest and upright heart and conscience. You're going to do your best to find out what the truth is as it's stated in the Word of God, and you're going to listen to nothing else besides that. Amen. That is going to be your, your delight and your song every day, and nothing else is going to be. It doesn't matter who comes teaching what. When people, people fear these great ministers and ministries around, they fear them, and so they believe their report, their words, when they're contrary to the report of the Lord and the words of God. Amen. And I fall into that snare myself before Amen. because I wasn't properly taught. People try to bring you into bondage. And see, that's what I told this brother. I said, I'll not put up with that. I said, I'll get downright mad and angry. He said, I can tell. He said, you're always talking about whenever you talk about some deceiver, he ought to be burned or skinned alive or gassed, one of the three. And I said, well, that's about the truth. Amen. That's right. I said, now, personally, I don't hold anything against anybody who's ever deceived me. I don't even think about it anymore as far as they did something to me. But I said, in another sense, I won't ever forget that as a learning lesson, a learning lesson that that's not going to happen again. And for all practical purposes, I mean, Deuteronomy 13, they were killed in the Old Testament false prophets. That's right. So I said, that's just a figure of speech of mine. But I said, that is literally what they, and technically what they do deserve, to be gassed or skinned alive. Right. Whenever they go around saying, thus saith the Lord, when it's thus saith you and not the Lord. Yeah. He said unto them, I am a Hebrew and I fear the Lord. My father, no, the God of heaven, which made the sea and the dry land. The sovereign God. That dry land that he wished he had a little part of about now. <laughs> and also, not absent from the Old Testament, is fear of the Lord as Father, as a tender, gracious Lord. Psalm 33 and verse 18. You will want to look at this, Psalm 33, 18. It doesn't read like the other verses. Of the God who is king of nations, or the God who made the heavens and the earth and the sea. But it's a tender reference to the Lord and of our fear for him. Behold, the eye of the Lord is upon them that fear him. But this is fear him in a different sense. Because along with this goes loving trust and hope. Uh, well, the verse even mentions upon them that hope in his name. It's not the fear of God as sovereign king and the ruling despot that controls the destiny of our lives and of our future. Psalm 103 and verse 13. You know this is a chapter on the tenderness of God, not the almighty God. Psalm 103 and verse 13. Fear of the Lord as Father. This is not insignificant material that we're giving you because most places where you study something about fear, they'll always reduce it to godly reverence. Mm -hmm. And they don't see a, a dual aspect. <clears throat> Both Testaments, we'll get to the new later, 
But both testaments, a dual aspect of fearing God as sovereign king and ruling despot and fearing him as an understanding, gracious father who, because of what Jesus has suffered, he can be touched with the feeling of our weaknesses. Like as a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him. You see, even the context is father. God is father and not God is sovereign Lord. Like as a father pitieth his children, then your father pities you if you fear him as your father. Psalm 147 and verse 11. The Lord taketh pleasure in them that fear him, in those that hope in his mercy. You see, hope and faith are always connected with this type of fear. We've got two passages for that. Psalm 33, 18, which we gave you, and Psalm 147, 11. Then Proverbs chapter 14. In verse 26, you can run references and determine which ones refer to the fear of God as king or the fear of God as father. In the fear of the Lord is strong confidence. See, now we have faith. In the fear of the Lord is strong confidence. And his children have a place of refuge. So we see twofold end to our fear. God is king, God is father. Thus we have two different types of fear. Let me try to describe the two different types of fear as they seem to be meant here in these passages, although the word is the same. The context, obviously, is always different when you're swapping from fear of the Lord as king and fear of the Lord as father. Which of these should you have? Well, the scriptures, of course, teach both. Fear of God as sovereign king means we are to have an all and a holy fear for his majesty and his holiness and his power and his glory and for his eternal decrees. That's not fear of the Lord as Father. That's fear of the Lord as the Almighty God, the God of all power, the God of all glory and majesty, and the God of all holiness. Where you fear him because, well, to use man's figures of speech, he's like Zeus on top of Mount Olympia. You fear him as a sovereign king. Now, this, this type of fear, you'll also hear probably some of these words used in discussions on fear, and uh, correctly so, but still incorrectly because they're trying to reduce everything to godly reverence. This type of fear, the awe of the majesty of God, it, like we read there in Job 37, verses 23 and 24, or, or with Jonah and Jonah 1, 9, a fear of the Lord for his majesty because of his great power. He's the creator of the ends of the earth. This type of fear is not a cringing fear or horror or terror because the scriptures teach that this type of the fear of God is reserved for the wicked on the day of judgment. This, this holy godly awe and just total admiration is a type where you may bend your knee before the Lord or bow your face before him. It would certainly be in that context, not of God as Father, but as, as the Spirit of God bears witness to your heart that he's sovereign, majestic Lord and creator of the ends of the earth, you may bend your knee in that type of fear. You may bow your face, but you'll never shrink over into the corner being afraid of God. You see, afraid and fear, by that we mean two different things. You'll never head to the corner in terror and, and utter fear of God because that the scriptures say is reserved for the wicked on judgment day. For instance, if you'll turn over to uh, 2 Corinthians, well before you look at that, we'll look in order Romans chapter 8 and verse 15. Romans chapter 8 and verse 15. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. 
See, fear that produces bondage is not godly scriptural fear. I mean, it's godly, but it's godly for the wicked on judgment day. Fear that produces bondage. But ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. So fear that produces bondage and horror and terror are, is not to be equated with the fear of the Lord that the Christian is to have. And then over to the fifth chapter of 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 11. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to the, that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. So what's the, con the, the time context is the last day, the judgment seat, the judgment seat of Christ. Knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord. Well, Paul's not terrified of God, but he knows what the terror of the Lord is going to be like for the wicked on the last day. So he said, because we know the terror of the Lord, then we persuade men that you better repent and believe the gospel now. We are made manifest unto God, and I hope also are made manifest in your consciences. And then another passage would be Hebrews 10. Hebrews 10, verse 31, which could be taken in this context. We're going to use it for that as as we need it here this morning. Uh, it is speaking in, in some of the verses preceding from verse 26 down to this verse, verse 31, about God's people. But with the case of the Old Testament people, he's talking about visible God's people. He's talking about Israel. But these people, the people of God, who died without mercy, verse 28, under two or three witnesses, what happened to them? Did they make it into heaven? Well, certainly not. Those who perished in the wilderness, they didn't make it into heaven. Those who sinned against God and blasphemed the name of the Lord and picked up sticks on the Sabbath day, did they make it into the kingdom? No. Yet they were the people of God externally, visibly, physically. Therefore, verse 30, For we know him that hath said, Vengeance belongeth unto me, I will recompense, saith the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge his people. I explained that earlier so this verse here wouldn't throw you for a loop. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Not for a believer. You want to be in his hands. That's where it's safe. Amen. To be in the hands of the Lord. Amen. This is for the unbeliever. It's a terrifying thing. See, fearful hardly expresses it strongly enough here because this is the type of cringing horror and terror that's not for the christian that wasn't even for the old testament jew that's only for the wicked on the day of judgment it is a terrifying horrifying horrible is not the word or terrible but terrifying or horrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living god because when you fall into his hands in that way and not into his loving hands of care and nurture and protection then your days are numbered. And your name's written on the wrong roll, that's for sure, when you fall into the hands of the living God. Whoa. If you look over in Job 42, this is the type of fear. We're still on fearing God as a sovereign king. This is the type of fear, I think, that's expressed uh, through Job's experience in Job 42, verses 1 and 2, and then verses 5 and 6 to give you a better understanding of this type of fear. You see, you'll experience these, these um, types of fear at different times. By that, I don't mean that the fear of the Lord shouldn't be your habitation all the day long, because it should. But there's some times when maybe the Holy Spirit is working something in your heart, and you have a, such a clear view and a revelation of God as the creator of the earth, as a sovereign God. And you fear him for that reason, not because you might get spanked. That's when you fear him as father. But because you just think, we, we've talked about this recently around here, you think, well, he hardened Pharaoh's heart, he could harden my heart. He's a sovereign God. And you fear him in that regard. Now, Job recognizes this after he's been through his, his experience. 
Remember the so-called God speeches that in the book of Job, what are they all talking about? God said, here, Job, you have been mouthing off for all these chapters, you and your friends, but now he's talking to Job in these last few chapters about this, that, and the other. He said, but now I've appeared to you. He said, just explain to me how the snow falls. Explain how the dew is there the next morning. Explain how the hinds know how to calve at the right time. Explain how any of these, explain the spreading of the clouds, explain the constellations, explain anything, anything. He said, pick anything and try to explain it. And Job can't explain anything. Now, is that God as Father? No way. That's God as Sovereign Lord and King coming down threatening Job with, you, you just answer one of a thousand of my questions and I'll be satisfied. And Job can answer zero of them. Zero. Of these obvious common things, explain how the grass grows. <laughs> and they, people today think they can explain how that happens with the sun and so forth. Well, where'd the sun come from? Explain that then. Explain the water. Explain growth. How can a plant, you can't do it, just perch outside and absorb the rays of the sun and trying to produce yourself and grow bigger won't work for you, but it'll work for a plant, though. Explain what the difference is. Swallow some plants so you've got some of their, whatever they do it with, inside you. Still won't work, will it? <laughs> you, you can't explain any of these things. The sciences are things people shouldn't get into because there aren't any answers but God for things like that. The human Praise body, God. there aren't any answers to that. <laughs> That's why the psalmist in Psalm 139 said, I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Amen. And that my soul knoweth right well. Amen. And too many people don't know that right well today. That you've, you've got in your, from your brain, you've got 120 million connections, excuse me, trillion connections <laughs> that cause your body to function and cause you to be the way that you are. 120 trillion connections. Glory you just God. can't even fathom that. Hallelujah. But you can't fathom yourself. What are our thoughts? How can you be thinking things? You can't fathom anything. <laughs> That's why you just have to lay your hand on your mouth and plead ignorance before the throne of God. Which, you see, Job had to learn that lesson. And the Lord, I think, is teaching some of us that lesson. Amen. If you don't have his word for something, you're an ignorant fool then. And it's best just to say nothing. And these false teachers out there know nothing but say everything. Yeah. They should lay their hands on their mouth. Yeah. Say, I am a babe. That's what I say. We're, I am a babe compared to all of this stuff. All these deep things in the word of God. We are children when it comes to this. How can we? I mean, it's just remarkable. That's why it has to come by revelation and not human effort. Amen. Because how can you know heavenly things when you can't even know earthly things? Amen. <laughs> you can't explain anything about how your body functions or, or anything about it. Well, he says in verse 1, The Lord, or Job answered the Lord and said, I know that thou canst do everything and that no thought can be withholden from thee. Yeah, that's right. Then he says in verse 5, I have heard of thee by the hearing of the ear. But now mine eye seeth thee, wherefore I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. So he said, I'd heard of you before, and I was a righteous man with the knowledge that I had received earlier. I'd heard of thee by the hearing of the ear, but I didn't have a revelation of you like I have a revelation of you now. That's why you can criticize the denominations. Even though you know that people are going to put you in the same category as other people who criticize the denominations who are wrong in the way that they do it. So I know they're going to do that, but, but what else can I do, though? You still, you can't compromise. You still have to go ahead and do it. You know, I, I got a letter from someone not long ago, and they, were, they had heard some of my tapes, and they said, you know, you're always speaking about uh, what's wrong with everything and what's wrong with everyone. And you don't seem to know that there's so much good that can be spoken about. Well, I've said the same thing myself about other ministers. That all they know to do is preach about don't go to doctors and don't do this and don't do that when there's so many positive things to preach about. So you see, I get criticized for what I recognize myself people do, but I'm not doing no. And you know people are going to do that. They're going to say that of you, but there's nothing you can do except compromise. 
And you don't fear the Lord if you compromise. Amen. I recognize better than the person who wrote me the letter that there are a lot of, well, there are more good things to talk about than there are bad. But that doesn't mean you stop talking about the negative things, though. Or what are you going to do with a whole lot of the scriptures then? They talk about things positively and they talk about things negatively as well. We've leveled criticism against others because they, they seem to think that's all there is to talk about. Let's talk about your hatred for the denominational system. Well, I hate the system too. But there are other things to talk about on other occasions though. Amen. So we have to have this type of fear of God. I've heard of thee by the hearing of the ear. I know you can do everything and no fault can be withholding from you. And I've heard of you by the hearing of the, of the ear, but now when I see it thee, wherefore by I pour myself and I repent in dust and ashes. It's the I'll lay my hand on my mouth and walk away. Who is he that hideth counsel without knowledge? Therefore I've uttered that I understood not things too wonderful for me, which I knew not. So he goes away with his hand on his mouth. <coughs> because you fear the Lord as sovereign king. Whatever you know is minuscule compared to what he knows and to what he wants you to know. Then there's the other type of fear, and that's fear of the Lord as father. And he is a father. And because he is, he many times, such as Malachi 1.6, speaks of his relationship to us with a comparison of an earthly child and an earthly father. So fear of the Lord as, uh, as Father would be the respect, the respect that you have toward him like you would have toward a strong earthly father. This isn't fear of his majesty or something. This is respect. You fear displeasing him in any area because you know what the rod of chastisement is like. And as I've intimated before, the scriptures, Psalm 33, 18, Proverbs 14, 26, Psalm 147, 11, the scriptures imply that this type of fear of the Lord also involves a confident trust and a hope in the Lord, just like you would have in your strong earthly father. Do you see the difference here? You see, a God, when you fear him as a majestic Lord, he's, he's so far removed, he's hard to trust or hope in because he's so far removed. So the idea of hope and trust is not connected so much with that as it is when you get it back so that we humans can get a grasp on it. Oh, I can understand how I could trust him as heavenly father, but as sovereign God, I don't know whether I can trust him or not because what if he hasn't picked me to be one of those who can trust him? You see, you run into problems then when you fear him as sovereign Lord. But as heavenly father, you fear him with a confident trust and hope as well. You can trust in him when you know that he's your father. Without that, there's just a fear, but there's not a trust. Like whenever a person has a strong leader or a strong earthly father. If you're a strong earthly father, then your children, they're not, you know, all over your majesty or your glory. They're all over, over you, what you represent that you are an authority figure, you are a father figure to them. And therefore, that is the type of fear that we have reference to now whenever we fear the Lord as Heavenly Father. In other words, your child, all they can think of is rod of correction. That's why I fear my father. Uh, you couldn't make, you know, a parallel between that and fear of the father as sovereign father because fathers aren't sovereign. Only God is sovereign. But fathers are fathers, though. And if they are strong fathers, their children have that type of fear. Over in Ephesians uh, chapter 6, and you know, in case someone says, well, we're supposed to, children are supposed to fear their parents, but you said earlier uh, to fear no one. Well, again, it's the Lord's authority through the parent yeah. because God has placed them as the authority father figure in the family, then the children fear their father. But it involves a confident trust and hope in the graciousness of the Lord as well. You know that he's gracious, he's tender, he's easy to be entreated. You have a confident trust and hope in him along with that. 
Now, next, let's come to the New Testament. Some people think that fear is inconsistent with New Testament teaching on grace and the relationship of the believer with his father. They would think that such passages as Romans 8, 2 Timothy 1, 7, 1 John 4, 17 to 19 would be inconsistent with teaching on the fear of the Lord. Well, we've read the Romans 8 passage. We probably can all quote the 2 Timothy 1, 7 passage. God's not giving me a spirit of fear. Well, they say, <laughs> you know, some charismatics, they'll take that verse and say, well, God, that means we're not saved of God. They get all these weak, I don't even know where they get these notions, right. but evil spirits, because they got to keep emphasizing the authority of the believer, the authority of the believer. And you just emphasize the authority of the believer, and that means you're not afraid of anybody. You're not even afraid of God because you're a joint heir, and you're an heir of God and a joint heir with Christ. Yep. Well, you see, that's an overdoing of that teaching. Yeah. You're a joint heir, but you're a grain of sand at the same time. Amen. And you're a joint heir because he, by grace, has lifted you up and made you one. But that doesn't make you anything, though, Amen. but what he has made you to be. Amen. So the fear in 2 Timothy 1.7 is not talking about the fear of God, that God has not given us, you know, the spirit where we would fear him. Well, you're not saved if he hasn't given you the spirit where you fear him. The Holy Spirit will teach you to fear God. You're not saved. You're not being perfected in your Christian life. And thirdly, 1 John 4, I think we need to take a look at, verses 17 to 19. Hallelujah. You know 1 John 4 is about love. God loves us and we love God. For the continuation.